having seen how we calculate the areas and therefore the loads that columns will carry, we can now move into columns themselves and talk a little bit about the mechanics of how they work. So in this video, we'll explain the difference between crushing and buckling. And this will basically answer the question of, you know, we looked at axially loaded members in SciTech 1, right? They're the simplest ones because we have an axial load. We take the cross-sectional area, the allowable strength, and we should be done. In this video, we'll explain why that isn't necessarily the case for uh, anything other than very, very short, uh, very, very wide uh, columns. Basically, we've looked at two modes of failure in axially loaded elements. Uh, failure in tension is quick and dramatic, right? The rope snaps, uh, the cable gives way, the, the, uh, the weight falls. And compression, we talked about crushing. If we go past the allowable stress in concrete or steel, the material will actually kind of crush. If you do a little thought experiment, that's true in terms of columns that are shaped like hockey pucks, right? We can crush a hockey puck. But what happens when we try to crush something like a yardstick or a long tree branch? We know from experience that we don't actually crush the material. Long before we reach that kind of breaking load, we have a phenomenon that we call compression buckling or just buckling. And what this is, is the load trying to find the easiest way to the ground. And instead of actually crushing the material in a compressive element, the fastest way to the ground usually is to put that material into bending, to basically bend it out of the way and to have it fail, not in compression, uh, but, in, but in bending. And the way we get this is that as we compress a material, it has a certain resistance to bending, a stiffness that, that, uh, that forces it to take the load in compression. As soon as it starts to bend a little bit though, we find that the load that we're putting on it now is not just an axial load, but it's actually a bending load because the center line of this buckling column is now, uh, now has a distance between it and the center line of the load. And that imparts a bending moment to the column in addition to uh, the compressive load. And we get not a failure in compression uh, where the material is actually uh, disintegrating or crushing, but we get a failure in buckling, where the material is getting out of the way uh, and failing in, uh, in, in bending instead. The most kind of, um, I think, elegant example of this, uh, the famous engineer and educator Mario Salvadori would tell his class to design a, a column that was a mile high. And using the deflection formula would say, well, you know, does this column work or not? Deflection formula, you may remember, uh, E equals PL over A capital E, uh, where E is the total deflection in inches, P is the load, uh, L is the column length. Uh, the more the load, the more the length, the greater the quantity of deflection. And then what we have to work against that is the cross-sectional area of an axially loaded member and its modulus of elasticity or its stiffness. So Salvadori takes a steel shape, W21 by 122, 21 inches deep, 122 pounds per linear foot. And he says, right, uh, we're going to put a, a 10,000 pound load on it. The area of a W21 by 122 from the steel tables is 35 square inches. Modulus of elasticity of steel, remember, is 29 million pounds per square inch. And then a mile high column is 63,360 inches long. And so when you do the math, um, what you end up with is uh, that, uh, yes, first of all, it'll work uh, in compression. So 10,000 pounds is less than the compressive strength of steel times the cross-sectional area, right? Or seven times the capacity and compression that we need. And a mile high column would only deflect 0.62 inches when you run the math and put all the numbers to it. The stiffness of steel, that 29 million PSI, uh, means that it doesn't deflect very much, right? Less than three quarters of an inch. We know that this won't work, though. We know that a mile high column will be so flimsy uh, that it'll buckle, it'll bend, uh, and collapse long before it shrinks three quarters of an inch. So Salvadori's point was that loads always find the most efficient path to the ground. 
And if we're designing what we will call hockey pucks or short columns, uh, that path is through the, through the column itself, right? Trying to crush the, the, the column itself. But for long columns, the load is going to try to bend the column. It's going to try to buckle it, push it aside. That is easier than uh, compressing the column as, as it kind of wants to do. So when we were designing what we call slender columns, columns that uh, look more like columns and less like hockey pucks, our strategy is going to be to try to restrain the column. And we do this when we're designing radio towers, for example. We do this with guy wires that literally keep the column not only from falling over, but keep it from buckling in one direction or the other. We're basically restraining it from bending uh, and therefore preventing it from buckling, forcing the load to take the axial path to the, to the ground. Now, the uh, real danger with this is what we call eccentric loads. And the, the mode of buckling failure is, again, to develop a moment arm between the center line of the load that we're putting on the column and the center line of the column itself. And notice that it's a progressive failure. Once the column starts to move out of the way, as the column uh, bends, the center line at its midpoint gets further and further away from the center line of the load that we're putting on it. So it's a progressive failure. The column moves more, which makes the buckling moment greater. As the buckling moment gets greater, the column moves uh, farther. And we get a, a failure that is sort of a vicious circle. Eventually the column uh, breaks, and you can see here in our diagram, it's breaking and bending, tension on one side, compression on the other, uh, and the weight's going to fall to the to the ground. So we want to be very careful about where we're loading columns. We want to load them as close to their center line as we possibly can, and we want to prevent, wherever possible, eccentric loads from creeping in, uh, loads that are actually putting a bending moment onto the column itself. When we get into steel detailing, this is really important. We want to frame beams into column webs, uh, as you see here. Uh, here is a beam coming in, here is our column, and you can see that we have welded a couple of angles to the column web and then bolted the beam onto it. This takes the load from the beam and it puts it right into the column centroid. So it's putting as uh, little eccentricity into that load as we can. If we have to uh, frame the beam into the flange of the column, you can see that when we put that load on the column, we already have an eccentricity. We are already putting a bending moment into the column. We're already trying to make it buckle. This is often unavoidable. We often have to do this. But when we do this, our column now has to get sized not only as a column, but it also has to work as a beam because it's going to be carrying a bending moment from the, the, the girder that we're framing into it. may not be a very big one, uh, but every, everyone counts, right? Every eccentricity in a column uh, counts. So this structural engineer's preferred detail. This, of course, you'll notice is going to be easier for the steel workers to get at, right? We have the problem here of getting around the flange to get in and tighten those bolts. Classic case of uh, engineering performance versus construction performance. Now, how do we design for buckling? Well, there is, in fact, uh, some math to this. Uh, the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler in the 17th century, so notice before we are designing uh, iron and steel beams, uh, came, or iron and steel columns, um, came up with a formula that in any material, uh, would tell us where that column would be expected to fail, under what load that column would be expected to fail. Here is Euler's formula, and you can see it's relatively simple. We've got a constant, uh, pi. Here's the load that, that uh, we're going to come up with. And you can see that, just like deflection, uh, buckling is sensitive to uh, both the length. Here it's on the bottom because a, a longer column means uh, a lower allowable load, right? So the, the longer, the slender the column, the less load we can put on it. And what's on the top is what we have to help us carry that load. The stiffness of the material, modulus of elasticity, and notice, moment of inertia, right? That inches to the fourth figure that we looked at in beam design. This again tells us where the material of a cross-section is relative to its neutral axis. So stronger beams have a higher moment of inertia. 
And notice now that columns more resistant to buckling also have a higher moment of inertia. Good beam shapes are good column shapes when that column is subject to eccentric loads. So as an example, we can find the maximum load for uh, any uh, A36 seal shape that we want. Uh, here, if we want to find uh, how much load a 12 foot tall W16 by 40 can take, we go to the charts and we find the moment of inertia for this shape. Here's our W16 by 40. We come over and here is our moment of inertia in inches to the fourth. We will get to the moment of inertia around the Y axis uh, in a little bit, but for the moment, we're, we're just going to look at uh, moment of inertia around X. Modulus of elasticity for steel we know is 29 million PSI. And when we run Euler's formula, we square uh, pi, that's just a constant. Here is steel's moment of inertia. Here is, er, uh, sorry, steel's modulus of elasticity. Here is steel's moment of inertia. And then we have the length on the bottom and notice that we're converting it into, from feet into inches. And what we find is that that 12 foot tall column can handle a load of almost 400,000 pounds before it starts to buckle. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty high load, right? It's a relatively short column, 12 feet, a 16 inch column, uh, it has a, 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 about a, um, you know, less than a one to 12 slenderness ratio, right? So not, not bad, a relatively stocky column, uh, and therefore one that can resist not only compression, but it's also going to resist uh, bending. It's gonna resist any buckling that, that it's subjected to. Now, just for fun, if we take Euler's formula and we apply it to Salvadori's column, right, what we find is that when we run the math, even though we have a massive uh, modulus of elasticity up here and a pretty good uh, moment of inertia for W21 by 22, um, we have a massive number down here, right? A mile of inches uh, is an enormous figure, four million something. So what we find is that Euler says that column can only carry 21.72 pounds. And even then, if we take the weight of 122 pound per linear foot column and extend it for a mile, uh, we find that the column itself weighs 644,160 pounds, right? A little bit more than uh, 21 and three quarters. So in fact, there is a point at which the column under its own self weight will want to buckle. Right? We could use Euler's formula, we could do iterative work to figure that out, but intuitively we know that at some point, well before a mile high, uh, that column is not going to be able to carry its own weight without buckling. Now if we added guy wires, as if we were designing a, a radio tower or a, a TV antenna or something like that, um, we find that if we can divide the, uh, the, the, the height go from 5,280 to 1,000 feet. And notice that we still have a mile high column, but now we're taking what we call the unbraced length and we're lessening it by a factor of five, right? We're adding guy wires to basically keep those points in the same place in space. Uh, and now we have multiplied the, um, uh, the, the, the carrying capacity of the column by five times, by more than five times, right? By more like uh, 10 times. Now, of course, that 214.4 pounds is still gonna get chewed up by the self weight of the column. At some point that might still buckle, um, but we've got much, much better performance here than we did uh, with just the, the simple unbraced column. And we could find a point again at which that column could carry its own self weight uh, over a period, probably over a, a span, probably uh, less than a thousand feet, maybe more like say 500 feet or something, where the cumulative weight of the column over that 500 feet and the carrying capacity of the column using the buckling formula uh, would match, right? Eventually we'd get a, a point where that W21 shape could go for a mile high, uh, just with many of its points being braced in space, preventing it from buckling, preventing it from getting out of the way uh, of that load. So knowing this, uh, knowing that columns can fail by crushing or more commonly by buckling, um, we have a couple of things that we can play with to make for strong columns, to make for columns that, uh, that will resist both kinds of failure. Um, the material, not only the ability to withstand compression, but I would also add the ability to withstand bending. 
right? So steel is a good one, very, very high modulus of elasticity. And notice that's different from strength. We're not often designing columns purely for strength, unless we're designing very short ones, hockey pucks. We're usually designing them for stiffness. And so, for example, steel and aluminum, very similar uh, uh, carrying capacities and strength, uh, but steel has a much, much higher modulus of elasticity. And therefore, even though the two metals are both very strong, we never see aluminum columns, right? We always see steel columns because it's stiffer. It resists buckling uh, that much better. We talked a little bit about slenderness. We'll come back to that and we'll talk about um, how to make columns less slender, not with guy wires fixing points on them in space, but with the end connections, how the connections, the way they're connected to both the girders, uh, usually at the top, foundations at the bottom, how those connections can contribute to basically changing the slenderness of a, of a column, making a column work like uh, one that is much, much shorter. And then finally, resistance to buckling. We saw in Euler's formula how moment of inertia contributes to that. Um, in a video coming up, we'll look at how we have to be a little bit careful about how we measure moment of inertia and its, its resistance, the resistance that the shape adds. We are not only worried about uh, the, the, the strong axis as we are with beams, but we're worried also about the weak axis, the Y axis in a, in a W shape uh, and how we have to actually design for that as the, as the worst case. So we're looking, even though allowable working stress uh, comes into it, we'll always check columns uh, for failure and crushing. When we're designing co columns, we're usually over here uh, looking much more at modulus of elasticity uh, and stiffness. And you get some idea about why steel makes for such great columns, because its modulus of elasticity is really, really high, right? Like off the, off the charts. Okay, we will get into slenderness ratios uh, and this other uh, shape property called radius of gyration, uh, a derivative of moment of inertia that reflects a little bit better how columns actually behave. And we'll talk about why when we're designing columns, we're not just talking about uh, the radius of gyration per se of a shape, but why we're always designing for the least radius of gyration, the worst case uh, in any column shape. We'll then go on and we'll talk about the contribution of connections uh, how uh, we have both the actual length of a column and then looking at the way those, that column is connected, how we can talk about the effective length, and then we'll get into the fun stuff, how we actually design columns uh, for given situations and the kind of language that they give to us uh, architecturally.